Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us today. I hope the content encourages you and helps you build your faith. Now enjoy the message. It was fun celebrating life change, wasn't it? Seeing people get baptized, hearing testimonies, seeing everything that God has done. And then um, I, should have, I should have seen this coming, right? We're celebrating uh, one of the best weekends we've had. As a church, we're celebrating life change. We're celebrating God's faithfulness to us. We are declaring His goodness as a people, and we're believing that He is good, and we're trusting that He is good, and we're walking in the fact that His character is good, His intentions are good, our experience of Him is good, and what was the last one? His plan for us is good. We're living in that, we're rooted in that, we're walking in that, and then Monday comes and my whole week explodes. And it's like, I should have been smart enough in foresight to know that when, the, when, when we go after the goodness of God, where is the enemy going to try to attack? You know, sometimes the enemy will try to attack you in the place where God is trying to do the greatest work in you. God really wants to do something in you, and he wants to do something in you to help you experience a greater revelation of his goodness. So you're walking in this truth that you want to grow in his goodness. I am personally, I'm just giving you my personal journey. If I'm saying, God, you are good, your character is good, your intentions are good, you want good things for me, and you have a good plan for me, and I hit Monday, and from Monday till yesterday morning, it was just a very difficult Week. We had car troubles. I hurt my shoulder again. My kids were, were facing troubles. My house was troubled. My, at work, I just had things that we were planning on getting done that didn't get done. And, and I had missed a few things. And, and it was just one of those weeks where it was difficult. So difficult, in fact, that I, I went to my, I, I made it through all the week. And then Saturday morning, yesterday morning, I got up early. And usually the, the one day of the week I try to get a little rest is Saturday. But got up really early. I went to my office and I sat down to meet with God. And I was sitting there in my own personal time. And I was, I was talking to the Lord and I was thinking about the goodness of God because we're preaching about the goodness of God and we're going through a season of the goodness of God. And I remember just saying to the Lord, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm trying to tell people about your goodness and, and it's just difficult right now. And I, I kid you not, as, as clear as the Holy Spirit has ever spoken to my heart, I didn't hear an audible voice, but right to my heart, I heard so clearly, Luke, you don't get to just preach about this. You've got to live this. You don't get to just walk up here and declare it. You're going to have to live it. You're going to have to, in the midst of difficult weeks, still declare, God, you are good. I know some of you think I wake up to an angel choir every morning and I am lifted, elevated out of bed by the presence of God and worship music is just playing all the time and I walk into my kitchen and the bacon is simmering and the coffee is pouring and the eggs are over medium, not too runny, but not too hard and, and I just sit down and enjoy a beautiful breakfast before I go to work and pray all day right? And I never get up before the mall's open because that's a, you know, preacher joke. The preacher's sleeping in, waiting until the mall's open. They get, but, but no, 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 I, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm talking to the Lord, and the Lord's saying, if you're going to preach it, you're also going to have to live it. And then I had this vision in my mind of coming before you and declaring the chant that we have kind of coined the chant of this season, and I had this challenge in my heart of you can't just say this back to me. You've got to decide to believe this tomorrow. And you've got to decide to believe this on Tuesday. And you've got to decide to walk in this on Wednesday because we're not just paying lip service to God. We are telling God the foundational beliefs of our heart that God is good and all the time we're not preaching that. We believe that today. We walk in that today. And it doesn't matter what has happened in our week. It doesn't matter what we've gone through. God is still good. You understand this, right? Situation doesn't change identity. Situation can't change identity. Identity will change us in our situation. Said a different way. What you go through doesn't change the fact of whether or not God is good. God is good will change your perspective of what you go through. You get that, right? 
So when we declare God is good and we stand in the truth that God is good and I got my all the time, God is good and all the time, when we stand in that, and we don't just say that, but we believe it, and we believe it on Monday when we get news that we never expected we were going to get, and we believe it on Tuesday when we face a difficulty, and then we, we believe it on Wednesday when, when it all comes up again, and we're still walking in the truth that God is good, then we will see the goodness of God all the days of our life, like we'll declare in the psalm today, but we've been a little nostalgic the past couple weeks. So I thought I would take us on one more journey down memory lane. If you didn't start with us when we started the church and you've been here the past two weeks, this is kind of the final pinnacle thing that you need to know about us and then you're, you're part of the culture again, right? So we launched August 20. And by the way, this week to me, again, I don't know what my problem is, but I'm probably going to get choked up. I know it's awkward when grown men get choked up on stage, but I just want to warn you, it may happen. This weekend means more to me than probably any of the other weekends that we've had in our church. Not, not today, but just this weekend symbolically throughout the timeline of our church. And I'll tell you why. We launched August 20, 2017, which would have been two weeks ago that weekend. Awesome weekend. We had over 100 people in standing room only. I mean, it was, it was crazy. In the old LSC, there were people standing, wrapped around. It was just this pinnacle weekend for us. We had been believing for a year, assembling a team, praying, trusting God, putting all of our effort and energy into it, and man, we launched strong. That is in the top 5% of church launches across the country. Is we, we launched incredibly strong, right? I am fired up. Well, I wasn't even walking. I was floating out of that LLC when we were leaving. I was like, man, the Lord showed up so big, you know. I was so excited. We had a launch party that night. We all met up and, and had fajitas and queso, the God's food, the manna from heaven. And we celebrated the goodness of God. And, I mean, we went big with it. And we, we partied. And then uh, Thursday, August 24th, the Thursday after we launched, Hurricane Harvey hit. That Friday, the 25th, I got a phone call from the LSC saying, um, hey, half the campus is flooded, we're out of power, and water is leaking into the lower hallway, you all can't have church on Sunday. We launched on the 20th. Church plant gurus will tell you the first three weekends are the most important. We're canceling the second one. We had this momentum, we had this excitement, we had this desire to get engaged. Your second weekend's your most important. Your launch weekend, everybody's fired up, and then you tell all those people to go invite more people, and you carry that momentum into a snowball downhill, and you just build, and you build, and you build. And I'm a builder. I was building from the beginning, planning from the beginning. We, we knocked this first weekend out of the park, then we hit the second weekend with all the follow-up, and that third weekend, we're off to the races. No, that Friday, they say, hey, we're canceling. You, you can't use the LSC. That Saturday morning at five o'clock in the morning, the Coast Guard was walking around my neighborhood. I went outside, saw flashlights outside of my house, and they said, you have 30 minutes to evacuate this neighborhood. They're releasing the dam, and when they do, the San Jacinto runs behind your house. Uh, it will raise in feet, not inches. And if you don't get out of here now, we're closing off the entrance and exit to your neighborhood. You guys, are, you guys are stuck with it. I was waking my family up at 5 o'clock in the morning, pulling my kids out of bed, packing up everything that we could get, threw it into my truck, barely got to 45, headed down 45. We were headed to Corsicana. We found one hotel room available in Corsicana. I mean, it was crazy. It looked like refugee camps. There were people sleeping in the floor of the lobbies because their reservations were up and other people had booked it. And we walked in there and it was me, my children, my wife, and my mom in one hotel room together. And I'm literally sitting in there thinking, so we, we go all day and we go into the night and it's three o'clock Sunday morning now and I'm laying next to my wife and we're in bed. Don't, don't you start crying. You're going to mess me up. <laughs> and I was, I can't look at her right now. 
and we were laying in this bed together and we were getting text messages from our neighbors that were saying, uh, the water's in my garage, the water just got to my front door, the water just got here, and my neighbor was texting me pictures as the water was rising up in our backyard, covering up our patio, entering into our garage, and we literally went from one of the greatest weekends that we've ever experienced, just seeing God's faithfulness show up in a way we never imagined, to laying in bed on Sunday morning at 3 o'clock in the morning crying, thinking, have we lost everything? Have we lost our house? We lost a vehicle. Have we lost our home? Are we going to have anywhere to go back to? Are we going to have a church when we get back? Is anybody going to show back up? I mean, we literally canceled the second weekend. Is anyone going to be here? What are we going to do? By about midweek, that next week, power, by the way, praise the Lord, only God could do this. The water had risen, to, it, within, it went in two inches into our garage, and then all of the water receded. So we had this water line in our garage. It got literally that close to our door seal before everything went away, so no water got into our home. We got back. Yeah, we can praise the Lord for that, right? So we got back, and that next week, uh, I'm just trying to, to wrap my mind around what are we dealing with? What do we have? We lost the vehicle. We don't know what's going on here. Uh, is anybody going to show up to church? And it was this weekend. And I remember, um, I remember we had a, a little green room that I used, to, I used to sit in in the old LSC. And I remember sitting in that green room, and I didn't plan to tell you any of this, by the way, but uh, I j it just kind of all hit me. And I remember sitting in that green room, and I remember walking out as the first worship song had started, and I saw a building that was packed. And I remember thinking to myself, God, you are, you are so good. You are so much better than what we could expect. You are so much better than what I thought you were going to do. God, you are better. I remember thinking this. This is so just me thinking in terms of building something. I remember thinking, God, you are so much better than a one-year marketing plan. We spent one year planning out the first three weekends of the church. One year planning out the reach, the follow-up, the drive, the momentum, capitalizing, building it into something, all of the systems in place. And I remember thinking, one year marketing plan, everything we prayed and prepared has been destroyed, yet here we are, and God, you are so much better than what I even thought you would be with a one year plan. Can I tell you something? You may be in here today, and let this weekend be symbolic for you too. You may be in here and you may have planned for years for something to happen only to find out that it hasn't. Can I tell you something? God is so much greater than your plans. God is so much bigger than the plans that didn't happen, that didn't work out. And if you will just stay in it a little longer, if you will stay with it a little longer. See, this is where the enemy tries to distract us. He tries to stop us. When we have these plans and we have these expectations, and the second they don't work out like we thought, we have the choice of do I get stuck here or do I keep pressing forward? Do I keep believing that God is good in the midst of a situation where it looks like we just lost everything? And I, I, I lived it. I remember this weekend, two years ago, thinking, God, why would you get my hopes up and then all of a sudden make us cancel and destroy everything? <laughs> Look, it's so silly. Here we are. Right? Some of the greatest, the greatest weeks in the life of our church, and there was a time where I thought it was over, yet if you'll just stay in it a little bit longer, you will see the goodness of God. You will see his goodness for real because he is good. And he desires good things. And he's bringing good things to pass. And it may not be within the context of your plan, but it is within the context of his character. God is good. God's going to do good. Victory is at the end of this thing. You've just got to keep pressing forward a little longer. You've got to stay in it a little longer. You've got to look right in the face of that adversity and say, you know what? God is still good in the midst of this diagnosis. God is still good in the midst of this loss. God is still good in the midst of this broken plan. God is still good in the midst of this shift that I did not see coming and I had no idea was going to happen. God is still good in the midst 
of bad news. God is still good. And if you stay rooted in that goodness, you're going to see it one day. I promise you, you're going to see it. Wow. That was just extra credit. We got a message to get to now. All right, let's jump in. Psalm 23. Ready for Psalm 23? This is the psalm that was made famous by a rapper named Coolio. Guys, do you have a refresher for him? Refresh their memory for a little bit. You got it? Something? Anywhere? Maybe? Hey! Now look here. This is, this is the way I remember Coolio, right? I remember when he hit the stage and Gangster's Paradise happened in Psalm 23, 4. I didn't even, I, honestly, I did not even know that was a Bible verse. I, I thought it was Coolio's lyrics. I was like, wow. So I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I take a look at my life and... What? <laughs> All right. That's good. <laughs> okay. We're good. <laughs> Great job. Throw back up that first picture of Coolio. Show me Coolio. This is what I remember him as. Some of you, it's funny because the, 20, the 30s and 40s in our church are like, uh, wow, that's an old song. The, 40s and, uh, the, the 50s and 60s are like, if that ever happens again, I'm leaving this place, you know? <laughs> the 70s and 80s are like, did you hear something? I didn't know if I, if I heard. <laughs> and the, the, the teens and 20s are like, who on earth is Coolio? This is how I remember Coolio. You may recognize Coolio now. Do we have Coolio? Now this is Coolio now. Yeah. Hey, 20 years isn't friendly to anybody, right? <laughs> you all may recognize him like I recognize him when he had the full, the full thing going on, right? There he is. That's my Coolio. That's your Coolio, all right? At any rate, I remember the first time I heard Psalm 23 uh, read at a funeral. And I, honestly, I thought, the, I thought the pastor was quoting Coolio. I was like, what is going on? This is crazy. You and your homies might be lined in chalk. All right. <laughs> Psalm 23. <clears throat> this is actually the Bible. This is not Coolio. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Verse 4, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessing. Surely goodness and unfailing love will follow me, will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. We've got four declarations to make from this passage of Scripture, but in order for us to make those declarations, we have to see everything in light of Psalm 23 verse 6. Let me read to you Psalm 23, verse 6 again. He says, surely goodness, I, I learned it, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, but surely goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. That word forever indicates a present reality that continues to eternity. In other words, he's saying, surely, goodness and unfailing love, the goodness of God and the mercy of God will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. They will follow me starting right now and they will follow me all the days of my life until I'm in heaven. We have to catch that if we're going to see what he walks us through in 1 through 2, 3 through 4 and verse 5 that it's the goodness of God and it's the mercy of God that leads us through the most difficult times of our life, the valley of the shadow of death, that makes us a table, prepares it for us in the presence of our enemies. It's because of the goodness 
and unfailing love of God that we walk through those things. And I love this word, this Hebrew word for pursue. It's a word that they used to use to actually describe nagging dogs that would chase you. He's saying the goodness and mercy of God chase you like a nagging dog, like a dog that's biting at you. We have some friends that have a pit bull. And I remember we were going over to their house. This thing is, is stacked, too. It's this big, bulky pit bull. And as we were driving, the, the only thing I regret about this is not having my camera ready because we were, we were pulling up to their house, and there was this guy that was outside jogging. And as he was jogging, it was like the picture-perfect moment. This, my, my friend's pit bull busted through their fence and took off running after this guy. And I mean scared this guy to death. He started high stepping like Deion Sanders. He's like, he's like, what? And and then he turns around and he he starts knuckling up and he starts, yeah, it looked like he was saying fire truck the whole time. And he's just he's just yelling at this thing. You know, he's like, rah, 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 and he's he's wanting to fight it. And I'm like, dude, you can't like you gonna fight a pit bull, man. This is a, and this dog would stay back at this distance and he would come at it and then he'd he'd turn and try to run a little bit and it'd run right up onto his heels. I mean, right up, and he he'd turn around real quick and he'd, he'd come out like he was going to fight and the dog would back off a little bit and he turned to run and it was like over and over and over the guy could not get anywhere because this dog was on top of him it was right behind him it wouldn't leave him alone that's how goodness and mercy pursues us it's on us it's chasing after us. It is right behind us, and the pursuit of it is nagging us and trying to get a hold of us. And as it does, we, we begin to really experience the goodness of God. As it relates to Psalm 23, I'll walk you through the three instances, or four instances, where the goodness of God and the mercy of God pursue us through, number one, Psalm 23, 1 through 2, says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. In his goodness, in his mercy, I'm fully satisfied. I am fully, completely Everything that I need is satisfied in him. Listen, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. John 10, 11 says, I, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. We have a good shepherd. And Psalm 23, 1 says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. In his goodness and in his mercy, I find everything that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. When he is my shepherd, in his goodness and mercy, I find rest and I find peace. If you are in here today and you feel worn out, you feel chewed up and spit out, you feel worn out, you feel anxious, you don't have any peace, you're looking for peace, you find that peace, you find that rest in the truth that the Lord, as my shepherd, the one who is leading me through his goodness and his mercy, I have everything that I could possibly need. I, uh, the other day, I was leaving the house with my son. We were going to run an errand, and I, I took him out to the driveway, and I, I put him in my truck, and I, I buckled him in, and I opened up my door, and I went to get in my truck, and I realized I didn't have my phone. I was like, oh, no, I got I to gotta go get my phone. So I went inside. Yes, I, I left him in the truck. The AC was on. The garage door was open. All you people calling cops on people for leaving a kid in the car for 30 seconds. This is Texas, not California. He's going to be fine. He's good, you know, no, he's, and, and so I walked in, and I was like, leave doors open, and I looked at the counter, and my phone wasn't there, and I started looking around, I was like, well, I don't know where my phone's at, and I told Anna, I said, hey, will you go watch Kanan, he's in the truck, I've got to find my phone, and so I ran upstairs, and I looked in my office, and I couldn't find my phone, and I, I was looking in the bathrooms, I was looking in drawers, I was looking in kids' closets, I was looking in everything, and Anna was like, hey, babe, are, are we about ready to go here, are you going to leave, and I said, I cannot Leave my house without my phone. And I, I wish I could say it was the Holy Spirit. I really just think it was common sense that asked me the question back, is that true? Can you not leave this place without your phone? And so I was like, 
fine. I'll try it. And I went down to my truck, and I got in my truck, and it literally was not, we didn't even get out of the neighborhood. And I was reaching to my cup holder to grab my phone to turn the, the podcast on that I was listening to, and I was like, I don't have my phone. I don't know where my phone's at. And so we get to the store, and I get my wallet, and I get Canaan out. I'm like, shoot, I left my phone in the truck. And I was like, no, my phone's not even in the truck. I don't have my phone. And so then I get there, and we go through, and we get what we need at the store, and then we come back out, and I, I put him next to the truck, and I, this is a true story, I literally put him in the truck, and I reach in the basket, and I'm like, man, I forgot my phone in the store, and I was like, no way, I don't even have my phone, like it was just, what, what is happening to me, and, and, and I'll tell you something, a, a miracle happened, I actually went to the store, and came back, and I went without my phone, and we lived, <laughs> like we survived, everything was okay, you know, and I actually went an hour after that, and I couldn't find the thing, and, and guess what, I'm still breathing, right? My kids are still good. But I, I realized something in the midst of that, that false expectations of satisfaction create all kinds of anxiety. I had a false expectation of satisfaction with my phone, that I have to have it or I can't go. And then all of a sudden when I didn't have it, anxiety was exploding, and I was reaching for it. I, I was literally, I thought I heard the thing ringing, and I didn't have any on me. I was like, what, my phone? No, I don't even have my phone. Thought I lost it three times on a trip. And I realized something. I put such an expectation of satisfaction on this device that it was creating this vicious anxiety in my life when I didn't have it. I was like, where is it? And I need it, and I, and I have to have it. And, and we do that with three different things in our life. I was thinking about this. We do this, create these false expectations of satisfaction on three different things. We do it with people. We put this expectation on people. It's your job to make me happy. You need to make me happy. And you need to do what I need you to do. And you need to say what I need you to say. And when you don't make me happy, it's your fault. And it creates anxiety in me because they're frustrating me. False expectations of satisfaction placed on a person will create anxiety. We do it with money. I need more money. If I had more money, I'd be happier. I need a better job. I need a promotion. So all of a sudden, we start projecting this, I need more money. I need more of this. And then as we begin to accumulate this, it's never enough, and it's not satisfying, and there's still problems in the home. I had a very rich guy tell me one time that the only thing he knows that poor people don't is that money doesn't make you happy. He said, bigger the home, bigger the problem. He said, we all got things going on. Money doesn't solve the stuff that you need, you need the Lord for. You need Jesus for. But we put this false expectation of satisfaction on money, and it creates anxiety. We do it to objects. We do it to stuff. My phone. I have this false sense of satisfaction with my phone that when I don't have it, and I'm not scrolling, and I don't hear it, all of a sudden it creates an anxiety, and I, I need a new one. I got to have a new one. Even further, it gets even worse than when we begin to blame that thing for not satisfying us. Blame people. I'm not satisfied because you don't make me happy anymore. I'm not satisfied because the raise that you gave me is not enough. The new position that I have is not enough. I'm not satisfied with what I got. I need something new. And so we start projecting these false expectations of satisfaction on everything around us. And then we wonder why we don't have rest and we don't have peace. Let me show you another, a different way. Here it is, by the way. Can't live without it. Where is it? You know? No. Uh, hey, Cam, come here. I, I want you here just to take my phone. Be very, very careful with it. No. <laughs> make, make a phone call. Make a phone call with my phone. Call whoever you want. Huh? You, you can't do it. Why can't you do it? Because you have to have the passcode, right? So I've put on you an expectation to do something for me but you don't have access to the contents that you need to satisfy that, right? So you're left stuck, and I'm left frustrated. Because I want you to make a call, but you can't. By the way, give Cam a hand. But this is, can I show you something? This is what we do. We say, make me happy. And when you can't, because you don't have access to the contents of my soul. You don't have access to the contents of my spirit. 
You don't have the ability to do in me what God can do and what the good shepherd can do in me. So the more I walk around and say, make me happy, satisfy me, do what I want you to do, and it's not happening, it's because they don't have access to what he has access to. When we place our expectation of satisfaction on our worship and glorification of Jesus, guess what? I have all that I need. I have everything that I need. I am fully satisfied in him. So in him, in his goodness, I am fully satisfied. Okay, we've really got to put the pedal to the metal here. Number two, Psalm 23.3 says, he renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. I love the, the phrase for he guides there. You guys can leave that verse up. He guides is a term of submission in the Hebrew. It's talking about being governed or being led by a leader that has been placed in place to lead you. The same phrase is used in Exodus 15 when it says that God leads the people that he has redeemed out of their slavery. In other words, it's suggesting that when we submit to leadership, we experience the renewing of strength. It's submission. The renewing of your strength is in relation to your level of submission. You need the Lord to really renew you. You need him to build you back up again. You need him to take you to new heights. It's, it's not about how far can you lead yourself. It's about who is leading you that can renew you, that can renew the strength that you have in you. My, my son and I, we were messing around the other day cleaning out my truck, and he was sitting in my truck, and he was, he was driving, right? He was pushing the pedals. He was about to rip the blinker off, you know, and he was, he was messing with the shifter, and he's, he's making the noise. Home Depot daddy and he's like turning and driving you know but then it, it was funny because in his mind he was sitting there and he was doing all the actions of driving but he was going nowhere because he didn't have the key and the key engages the power and when the key engages the power it will take you to where you need to go and the same is true with this verse here he renews my strength when he is the one leading me when his key is in my ignition and it's what's powering me and he's leading me where I need to go, then all of a sudden my strength begins to get renewed. Now let's go to the next one. In his goodness, Psalm 23, verse 4, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect me. We find in his goodness and in his mercy, that we are safe. We are fully safe. We are protected. There is a safe place to go. There is a retreat that we have that we can run to in the goodness and in the mercy of God that even though, what does it say? I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I am going through the most difficult time of my life. I went from greatest weekend I've ever experienced to crying in a hotel room, wonder if I lost everything. Even though I walk through those things, there is a place of safety for me. There is a place of protection for me. There is a place that I can retreat to. My son has figured this out. He's recognized that that place of retreat is his mom. Let me, let me just give you an, an example of, of what I deal with. You guys have you that? Go ahead. Me? Shut, your, shut your mouth off and come at me! <laughs> You want me to come at you? You want me to come get you? Show? You talking to a Cunningham boy? What did you just say to me? Run it again. Let it go again. Let it listen to this mouth. What did you just say kid? to me? Shut your shut your mouth off and come at me. <laughs> okay, okay, I've had enough. I'm ready to go punish him right now. Can I can I just tell you something by the way? He never talked to me like that until he started going to the nursery with your kids. I'm telling you, I don't know what y'all are teaching your kids at home. And he, he can't, I promise you, that was, I, that was not prompted. He and I were just messing around. We were fighting back and forth, and I tossed him up on the couch, and then he popped up and lets me, shut your mouth off and come at me, bro. <laughs> Who are you with in that twos and fours room, right? <laughs> what is going on? But here's what he does now. So he pops his mouth off, and he picks a fight with Daddy. You know, I'm, I'm not letting that slide. Like, I'll, I'll give it to you. You want to go? And so I go at him, and he runs, and he jumps, and he hides behind his mama. 
And Anna is like, I don't want to be hit. I don't want to be kicked. I don't want to be picked up. I don't want to be dropped. I don't want to be touched. Y'all just do not mess with me. Whatever you guys are doing, boys can be boys, but I don't want to be in it. And so he's, he's curling behind his mommy, and he's like, come at me. Come at me. Give me dead. And I come over to him, and Anna's like, you better not. Don't pop me with that towel. I don't want water on me. Don't hit me with that pillow. I don't want in the middle of your guys' stuff. So now I'm stalking, right? And I'm waiting for him, and I'm waiting for that moment when he forgets what's going on and goes to the toy box, and he's going to wind up inside that toy box and shut down. <laughs> but what he's recognized is that in our house, he has found a safe space. And any time he finds himself in a bit of trouble, he knows if he can get to the safe space, I can't touch him. Do you know you've got a safe space in the Lord the enemy can't touch you in? He can't get to you. He can't come near you. And it doesn't matter what's happening around you. When you get to his space of protection, his space of grace, his space of goodness, his space of mercy, he can't get to you. And now we'll finish here and I'll wrap it up quick. Psalm 23, verse 5. He says, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You, you honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessing. In his goodness and in his mercy, I'm secure. I, I have the security that no matter what I face, the adversity that I experience, listen to what he says in verse 5, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of of my enemies. I was reading and praying over that verse all week, and this thing came to mind. I grew up in a small town, right? Nothing like small town rivalries. Nothing like them in the, in the world. We grew up, and our rival was seven miles south of us. It was, it was Paola High School, and we hated them. We couldn't stand them. I mean, the things we did to each other. We had 55 guys one time go to the bathroom on their practice field, right? I mean, <laughs> It was just back and forth. They busted the windows out of our cars. I mean, it was like major. This rivalry was so bad that parents were getting in fights at the concession stands. Yeah. Yeah, these parents were fighting. They, I promise you, we were number one and they were number two in our conference and we were playing a football game and they had an orange fence ran through the parking lot for home parking and guest parking. They separated us in the parking lot because the parents couldn't quit fighting. They had to create a separate concession stand because you couldn't go around to the other side and go to that concession stand. The rivalry was so intense. And I remember when we were preparing for it, there was, I mean, it was in the newspapers. It was on the local news. These things were happening like crazy. Our coach came to our entire team as we were boarding the bus. We were going to play in Paola. It was an away game, one versus two. Everything is going crazy. He gave us these earplugs. And he said, I want you to put these earplugs in. And he said, I want you to forget about everything that's going on around you, and I don't want you to take them off until the opening kickoff. And we're like, Coach, what is going on here? And he said, I don't want you to hear what's happening around you because what's happening around you doesn't change the game that you're in. It has no bearing on the game that you're in. When you step onto that field, you have just as much an opportunity to win as you ever have. The game is policed by referees. And if you can block out all of this stuff that is happening around you and you can just focus on the game that is placed before you, we're going to be great. Do you realize this, that when he prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies, that even though we're walking into an away game and even though everyone may want to see you lose and Nobody want to make, see you be successful. God has prepared a place for you that they can't take away from you. He's prepared a shelter for you that can't be stopped. And in his goodness and in his mercy, we are secure. Hey everybody, thanks again for joining us. We believe God has something great for your life. And we hope this message encourages you to take the next step in your faith. Have a great week.